Welcome to session number two in a series, Models in Epidemiology and Biostatistics. My name is Gordon Hilton Fick. And today we're going to look at stratified analysis in more detail. In session one, we looked at a detailed example where there were two two by two tables. We saw quite a number of issues, and I won't review them all now. Perhaps you may wish to review session one before proceeding with session two here. Inevitably, then, we're going to be interested in the study of a disease exposure relationship. Disease, yes, no. Exposure, yes, no. And we are concerned that such a study of that disease exposure relationship may depend on other characteristics. And in particular, for illustration here, we'll suppose that we have the very simplest of scenarios. That is, age group, yes, uh, age group, young, old, and gender, male, female. Further, what we're going to explore here in this session is the use of the odds ratio to measure the disease exposure relationship. Now, all of what we're doing today could be done with the use of the rate difference or either the risk ratio or the health ratio. All of this could be repeated. But we're going to be considering the odds ratio today in this session because this is all essentially preparation for our first model in epidemiology and biostatistics, and that is logistic regression. We have some terminology. We have E for exposure, D for disease. Sometimes you will see a bar above the either the E or the D, meaning the absence of either exposure or disease. And when there's no bar, then it's the presence of either exposure or disease. And we'll, we'll use for young and old, Y and, y and O, and for female and male, male, we'll use F and M. Pretty standard. We then have two probabilities and two odds. We have the probability of disease for those exposed and the probability of disease for those unexposed. The probability of the absence of disease in both cases is one minus the probability of the presence of disease. Pretty standard stuff. These are conditional probabilities, given exposure or given the absence of exposure. Similarly, we have conditional odds, the odds of disease given the abs given exposure and the odds of disease given the absence of exposure. Probabilities and odds. The odds ratio in this instance usually is taken to be the odds of disease in the presence of exposure divided by the odds of disease in the absence of exposure. And we're typically anticipating that such an exposure is going to lead to an odds ratio that's greater than one. However, this is strictly definition here and fairly, but fairly widely used. Okay, how about the data we're going to see in such a two by two table? This is also a, a quite standard setup, so I'm just going to briefly illustrate it. It is fairly standard with the display of two by two tables or tables generally to display the outcome as the rows and the explanatory variable as the columns. So here we have two rows, very traditional here to place the cases first in the first row and the control second. Further, it's quite standard to place the exposed as the left-hand column and the unexposed as the right-hand column. Pretty standard again. Then we get 
the estimates of the probability in two cases. The probability given exposure and the probability given the absence of exposure. And you can see that such estimates are A over A plus C and B over B plus D. Further, we can, we can see very directly that the odds can be estimated quite symmetrically in, as we've seen, as A over C and B over D. Pretty basic. That means that we have an estimate of the odds ratio. So we write OR and put a hat over the OR and then write here that AD over BC estimates the odds ratio. Now we will see that AD over BC applies in a wide range of scenarios or at least approximates what we would want to see in those scenarios. We'll be coming back to this. The familiar AD over BC though may help you to, to place all of this in the right kind of context here. But just to remind you, the odds ratio without the hat is the population characteristic, and the estimate of it is the OR with a hat. So inevitably then, we're going to have many odds ratios here. We're going to have the odds ratio where we ignore age and gender, the so-called crude. <coughs> We're going to have age-specific odds ratios, two of them. The odds ratio for the young, the odds ratio for the old, ignoring gender. We have two odds ratios, one for each gender. The, man, the women... Odds, the odds ratio for the women and the odds ratio for the men, ignoring age. And then we have four odds ratios, one for each of the four groups determined by age and gender. We have an odds ratio for the young females, the old females, the young males, and the old males. So that's a total of nine odds ratios, or nine two-by-two two tables, and this is, in a sense, the simplest scenario where we have a disease exposure relationship, both dichotomous, and two potential additional explanatory variables, both dichotomous. There are nine odds ratios. It's already becoming rather daunting, many, many would argue. A lot in play. But it is, an, on the other hand, as we will see, amongst the most widely seen in epidemiology and biostatistics. There they are, the nine two-by-two two tables. So how do we make sense of all of this? How do we synthesize this information? What's crucial and what isn't? That's what we want to get clear in our minds with this approach to stratified analysis. We need a disciplined strategy, <laughs> a simple set of processes that we're going to try. What we want to be able to do is implement Occam's razor, razor, the idea that if simple is good enough, then display things simple in simple terms. But if more elaborate is needed, then do so. We want to avoid the simple when we can see that the science justifies it, that it's critical to get the science right. So we inevitably are going to have some symbolism we're going to use here. The odds ratio, of course, C for crude, A and G for age and gender alone and AG for the four strata. We'll, we will see that I'll use the symbol X when the value of that number is irrelevant and is not under consideration. And we'll see that pretty early on. Let's look now at the very simplest of circumstances. 
one that happens. It could be that although we decided to study age and gender and their impact on the disease exposure relationship, that it didn't matter. All nine of the odds ratios were the same. Notice that the four age gender specific odds ratios are all four. But so are the odds ratios specific to age or specific to gender or the crude. Here we would say, implementing Occam's razor, keep it simple. Okay, we're going to try and keep it simple. And report in this instance, if there's no other issues in play, that the odds ratio is four and carry on. Let's look at what might be the next most complicated situation. Gender modification. Let's have a look. Let's focus our attention, first of all, on the four age gender specific odds ratios. We can see that the two for the women are both 0 0.25 and the two for the men are both six. Hmm. Huh. So we can see that if I focus my attention on <coughs> the women, that age apparently has no impact on the odds ratio. If I focus my attention on the men, I can see the same thing. However, I can see that if I stratify only on gender, that we get a big difference. The odds ratio for the women is the number 0 0.25, but for the men it's 6. In other words, gender modifies here. But you can also see that we don't need to consider age at all. So we do need to report the gender-specific odds ratios. But notice here that we cannot, we cannot stratify on age alone because we have detailed that the odds ratio for the women is different from the odds ratio for the men. And in particular, if I was to attempt to combine, let's just take this for example, if I was to attempt to combine the men and the women who are young, then I'd be combining an odds ratio of 0 0.25 with an odds ratio of 6. Notice that that combination of those two numbers somehow applies to neither the, the young women or the young men. In other words, this grouping of the, of, the, of the men and the women who are young applies to no one. The same thing is true for the old, grouping the, the women and the men who are old, applies to no one. Hence, we cannot use that. And you'll see there, these two odds ratios are not reported. And clearly the crude is not. And we get a, essentially the same circumstance here. That if we wish to study a disease exposure relationship, we need to consider age because age modifies. And exactly the same issue is present here as was present in the previous slide. And that is that if I attempt to combine the, the young and the old who are women, I'm combining an odds ratio of 0.5 and an odds ratio of 4 that applies to neither the young or the old, who are women. Same thing for the men. 
So notice here that I must report the age-specific odds ratios in this instance. And the crude is of no, no value. And further, the gender-specific odds ratios are of no value. So just to summarize again, when one of the characteristics is, is detailing modification, whether it be gender or age, I need to stratify on that characteristic. Occam's razor says I do not need to, to consider joint stratification here. Notice that the four odds ratios could be reported, but if we're interested in getting the measure the issues here as straightforward as possible, we need to consider just the stratification on age. All right, let's have a look at our next example. Let's start again with the joint stratification on age and gender. And we see that all four of those odds ratios are the same. In other words, we could see there that, hmm, we could assume that there's a common odds ratio in those four groups, and it's five. But now let's look at if we were to stratify only on gender. We get the same number here, five. Huh. That means the assumed common odds ratio for both the women and the men is five, ignoring age. But now notice that that assumed common odds ratio for the men and the women is not the same as the crude. This is an example of confounding. Gender is confounding. And it is confounding that we are seeing quite clearly. Notice, though, unfortunately, if we had grouped or stratified on age, ignoring gender, we would have missed it. Mm hmm. In other words, we must stratify on gender, but age is irrelevant in this instance. And what we have is that the assumed common odds ratio for the men and the women is, is very large and is very different from the crude. This is an example of confounding. Notice in this instance, because age was irrelevant, that the assumed common age-gender odds ratios were all the same as well. However, it's important to notice here that we need not consider the stratification on both age and gender. We need only consider the stratification on gender. So this is an example of confounding where we have considered two issues, both age group and gender identified that in this instance, age is not the issue for consideration, but that gender is. Okay. How about the reverse? The same thing. I won't necessarily, I won't repeat all of this. So the age group gender odds ratios are all three. So we can see that there is an assumed common odds ratio here of three for those four groups. However, that's also seen with just the two age groups. In other words, stratifying on just age. The age-specific odds ratio for them. For the young is the same as the age-specific odds ratio for the, for the old. Okay, but now we can notice that it is different from the crude. Here again, we see 
that age is not the issue. Excuse me, that age is the issue. <laughs> but gender is not. Notice that stratification on gender would miss the confounding on age. A one-at-a-time assessment, if we only consider gender in this analysis, we would have seen, hmm, the gender specific odds ratios are the same and the same as the crude, so there's nothing going on. However, we can see that in fact age is confounding. Because if I stratify on age, I get something that's I get an odds ratio of three, assume common to the two groups, and it's different from the crude. Uh-huh. Now we're going to get a little more complicated. Again, these are scenarios commonly seen in health research studies. So let's start again with a, a consideration of the four jointly stratified age group gender odds ratios. Let's suppose that we have the same number, five. So what do we see now? Hmm. So the odds ratio assumed common to both age group and gender is five. Hmm. On the other hand here, we can see that if we had stratified on only gender, we would have missed the confounding. Notice this. Stratifying on only gender, we would have seen that if we had done an analysis that ignored age, we would have stratified on gender, got an odds ratio of one, compare, seen that the, it's one in both men and women, compared it with the crude, and said there is no gender confounding. But now we can see that that would be incorrect, wouldn't it? Gender is, in fact, an issue here. Mm-hmm. In fact, what we can see is that gender confounds the age confounding, and it's symmetrical in this instance, in a, in a certain way. Because what have we got? If we were to now consider a stratification on age and ignore gender, we would see that, hmm, there's confounding by age, but it's in the wrong direction. I hope you can see this. The 0 0.25 would suggest that the exposure is protective. But when we simultaneously stratify on age and gender, we see, in fact, that the exposure is a risk. It's deleterious. Uh-huh. So what we can see here is that Age confounds, yep, and gender confounds the age confounding. Mm-hmm. What do we report here? I hope it's clear. We would report the assumed common odds ratio common to all four strata. That number of five is the, is the big, big story here. That the odds ratio... A five, assumed common to the four groups, is crucial. Stratifying on age alone or stratifying on gender alone would have missed it. Aha! Uh -huh. So notice here we can see that age confounds the gender confounding. Age confounds, and gender confounds the age confounding. Right. I hope you're getting this. There's a fair bit to study here. The language I'm using to describe it 
is perhaps not as striking as the circumstance we see in these nine two-by-two two tables or nine odds ratios. Now, you might be thinking, okay, I w that means that I needed to simultaneously stratify an age and gender to correctly see that the exposure was a risk. Oh, my. Big deal, right? A big deal. <clears throat> now let's look at a circumstance that can also occur. <clears throat> Notice that there, if we begin with our, with our consideration of simultaneous stratification on age and gender, we see that the assumed common odds ratio here is 4. And that if we had incorrectly incorrectly stratified on either gender alone or age alone, we would have missed it. We would have missed an important disease exposure relationship. Let's have a look at this. If I had ignored gender and stratified on age, I get an odds ratio of one in both groups. Compared with the crude, we would say age doesn't confound. If we had done a one-at-a-time analysis of just gender ignoring age, we get these two numbers for the men and the women, compare it with the crude, and we would say there's no gender confounding. In this instance, what we've got is a consideration that age and gender both confound, and that the gender confounding is seen by stratification on age, and the age confounding is seen by stratification on gender. When you're reviewing this slide, you may find it helpful to think about a study that involves only those who are young and go through the process. Then do it for only the old. Then do it only for the women, then do it only for the men. You will see that if you carefully work through the logic here, that one must simultaneously stratify on age and gender to correctly see that both age and gender confound. Now, this is often seen as, uh, a, in epidemiology, one of the issues that's often missed. I cannot stress this enough. You will see in some literature that simply one at a time stratification on age and gender is sufficient to detect confounding. That is false. And we will see, as we, well, we have seen here, that there can be circumstances in which the only way to see what's going on with age and gender is to simultaneously stratify on age and gender. Wow. Another pattern that is, that is sometimes seen, and that is that gender modifies, but the only way to see gender modification is to adjust for age. In other words, in other words here, we will see with this set of nine two by two tables that age confounds the gender modification. In other words, gender modification is seen by stratifying on age. Okay? Gender modification is seen properly when we stratify on age. Hmm. Gender modification. Because I can see that if I were to, to ignore age, I would see that I get odds ratios of one for both the men and the women. But now, again, focus your attention, for example, on just the, the young people in the study. If I do so, I get an odds ratio for the women 
that is 0 0.25 and for the men is 6. In other words, for the young, gender modifies. This number, 0 0.25, is different from 6. Then we can also see that for the old, gender modifies. And we are comparing 0 0.25 with 6. Notice that that's, that comparison between the two genders is the same. So this number, 0 0.25 compared with 6, is displaying a very big difference. Right? That's, that is gender modification for the young. And the number 0 0.25 compared with 6 for the For the, uh, for the old, 0 0.25 compared with 6 is also telling us that gender modifies. Now notice if I did not stratify, if I did not stratify on age, I would have missed it because I would have then seen these two odds ratio being equal to 1 and being the same. Wow. So what can we see? The odds ratio that is common to the two female groups can be reported. So the assumed common, this number 0 0.25, can be reported, as can the assumed common odds ratio for the two male groups. But because these two numbers are different, we can see that gender modifies. Notice that gender modification is only seen by stratifying on age. And so we can see that age confounds gender modification. Wow. Again, it can be helpful if this is seeming a little, a little elaborate, is to focus your attention on just the young and then focus your attention on just the old. And, and go through the process as I've done. Now this also pops up in, in, in investigations. So what can we see? Well, okay. We've got modification and confounding. The simple description of confounding here needs to be considered in a more elaborate framework because of the fact that we're considering two potential modifiers, two potential, and two potential confounders. <laughs> All righty. Now let's look at the reverse or the where we interchange the role of gender and age. So the really tough part of this we've already gone through. All I've done here is pointed out that for this set of nine tables, for this set of nine odds ratios, we have that age modifies, but the only way we see age modification is with adjustment for gender. Oh yeah. In other words, the real issue here is the fact that we have assumed common odds ratios of 0.5 for both the young, uh, for both the women and the men who are young, and for both the women and the men who are old. Here we can see that the we have two adjustments here. We have adjustment for the young and adjustment for the old. And if I do adjust separately for the young and for the for the 
uh, for the young and the old, I see the gender confounds age modification. Now this is again, it's not 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 too straightforward, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> And there are there are examples, examples that will be seen in the in the practice uh, s s part of this session, which which I will illustrate coming up. Okay. How about a circumstance, and this one this one is maybe one of the most common. Both age and gender modify. Age modification depends on gender. Gender modification depends on age. What do we see in this instance? Hmm. Notice that if we focus our attention on the jointly stratified four two by two tables, we get four quite different numbers. What we're getting here is a complicated circumstance for reasons that need need a lot of study. But what we see is that for the old women and the young men, the exposure is a risk. But for reasons that we don't we would have to try to study, for the young men, for the sorry, the young women and the old men, it is protective, apparently. But the numbers are all different. Four and six different from 0.5 and one quarter. Here we need to report all four of the age-gender specific odds ratios. And then attempt to try to understand why such a complicated form of modification might, might be present. Who knows? It could be it could be crucial to the issue. Now it might be that this illustration of these four different odds ratios might be seen in circumstances where the two modifying variables here are are not age and gender but other other characteristics, or they can still happen in this instance too. And we have one more example to show you now, and that is that age and gender both modify, but that the age modification does not depend on gender and vice versa. Now this one is probably one of the least often seen, but is often detected with the statistical models we're going to be illustrating. Here again, we need to report all four of the odds ratios here. But there's something else going on, and the scenario is slightly simpler than it is in the previous. For example, if I take the ratio of 8 to 1 here, that's the same as the ratio of 4 to 0. 0.5. Uh-oh. Hmm. There's a, there is a simplification going on here. One that, that is revealed by the statistical testing that can be done. I think that's probably enough on this particular issue for now, only just to point out, I hope, and that when we can have very complicated uh, disease exposure relationships captured through odd of odds ratios when there are two potential modifier confounders. So we have now seen a number of different examples where we wish to study the disease exposure relationship. And we wish to do so when age and gender are potential confounders and or modifiers. And I provided that first part of session number two where all of the discussion was in the population domain. All of those odds ratios displayed in those many examples are in the population domain. 
I have prepared for you a number of examples of data sets designed to illustrate different scenarios that might be seen. The data sets are given in a fairly concentrated way as a single file, a single file that's .dta. You can refer to them in the folder and the the file is called session2examples.dta. What you're going to be able to do for each of the illustrations, and there's eight of them, is construct the nine 2x2 two two tables and consider them. You'll have the four jointly stratified tables, the two 2x2 two two tables stratified on age loan, the two tables stratified on gender alone, and the crude. Then you're going to want to spend time with these tables and determine which of the scenarios applies to this particular example. So, what I'm outlining for you, the state of commands that you may wish to consider. There's a simple table command that I'm giving you in this in this slide, and then a series of either CC or CS commands that will give you the stratified analyses that you may wish to consider. So up next is going to be one of the examples from the Session 2 examples file. All right, now I have opened a session for Stata and I have input the examples file, session2examples.dta. Your Stata window will perhaps look different from mine, but the, the basic setup should be about the same. What I've also done is prepared in the review window all of the commands that we might want to try, rather than my attempting to input them on the fly during this session. So the first command is use, and then you would position where it the command to wherever it is that you have you have downloaded the examples DTA file and then you can see there's the series of commands. Over here in the variables window we can see we have the indicator files for gender, age, exposure, and disease. Uh, then the reverse coded versions so that this first display will look correct and then the indicators for the four different uh, data sets which are available from this file. So let's ha now have a look at this first illustration then. You can see by using this table command in Stata we get the four two by two tables. We get the young women the old women, the young men, and the old men. You can see we've got disease, as is normally the case, the cases and the controls. The cases first, the controls second. I, that's why I have done this uh, setup for you with ND, NE, and GA, so that you can see everything. And then you can see we have then the columns exposed, not exposed, and so on. Here are the four two by two tables. There's the two by two table for the young women and so on. Then we can look at the four two by two tables with a odds ratio with an odds ratio analysis. If you then use if in Stata, 
you specify the uh, age, first age group, second age group, and so on. First age, age equals zero, gender equals zero, then age equals one, gender equals one, and so on. I've coded it so that the women are coded zero and the men are coded are coded uh, one. The young are coded zero and the old are coded one. You can see that from here. Let's have a look. There's the two by two table for the young women and that's coded age equals zero and age equals and gender equals zero gives us that two by two table. And what do we see? Huh. For the young women, with this two by two table, we get an odds ratio that's less than one. On the other hand, the confidence interval includes the null. Okay. This chi squared test supports the fact that there is no evidence of a disease exposure relationship for the young women. Okay, now let's look at the the old women and what do we see? We get an odds ratio of 3.44. A confidence interval, although quite wide, does not include the null and we can see that the test of significance is very small, indicating that for the old women there is a disease exposure relationship and exposure appears to be a risk because the odds ratio is placing <coughs> oh, excuse me the odds ratio is placing the exposed on the numerator and the unexposed on the denominator and so <coughs> yes indeed we do get a disease exposure relationship for the for the old women. Now let's look at the young men. For the young men, we get an odds ratio estimate of 6. Confidence interval that's ev that's wide again, but does not include the null in fact the we can say that with 95% confidence there is evidence that the odds ratio is at least 3.5 one nine. Wow. So for the young young men, evidence of a disease exposure relationship, the es estimate here even bigger than the estimate here. Now let's go to the the old men. Well, now we get a a odds ratio estimate that's less than one. A confidence interval that does not include the null. Suggesting that for the old men in this study that the exposure is for unknown reasons that for this illustration at least for this unknown reason uh, for this unknown for unknown reasons the uh, exposure appears to be protective. Huh. Okay. So there's our study of the four age gender specific two by two tables and four definitely different pieces of information being displayed. That's fairly clear. And indeed, if we look at a stratified analysis that summarizes what we've seen in those four two by two tables, we get very different odds ratio estimates in the four groups. Confidence limits that provide us with very different information. Okay. But keying on this, we can see the odds ratios are different. And the relationship with the men and the women it appears to be different. In other words, the odds ratio information or the odds ratio disease exposure relationship for the young women is uncertain. Maybe there is no relationship. 
for the older women, there, there appears to be very clearly a relationship. For the young men, there appears to be a very definite relationship. And for the, the old men, it appears there's a relationship, but it's in the reverse direction. Okay. Now, Stata dutifully reports for us the crude and the adjusted. It reports a crude of 1.5. Confidence interval does not include the null. Here it shows the Mantle Hansel adjusted odds ratio estimate. 1.45. Confidence interval getting awfully close to the null. Hmm, what am I going to do now? Well, the most important thing from this display and from what we've learned is that these odds ratios are different. It isn't just about gender either. It isn't just about age. The test for homogeneity of the four stratum specific odds ratios is highly significant, far less than 1%. Hence, the odds ratios are different. The estimates of the odds ratios are different. The test of significance for homogeneity is highly significant. That is clear evidence of modification. Further, at least qualitatively here, we can see that we cannot attach the modification to just gender or just age. It would appear that we have evidence that both age modifies and gender modifies. Notice that gender modification depends on age. And age modification depends on gender. So we have a complicated scenario here. The test of significance here does not detail all of the information and the interpretation I just gave. Here we have that the four odds ratios are very different. Okay? And not just about age or just about gender. This test of significance with three, three degrees of freedom is said to be omnibus, and we'll be coming back to this as we proceed through other sessions. It doesn't detail how the strata modify, only just that they, they do. All right. This is the reportable table. And let's look at in more detail why that is the case. The next table that I'm, that Stata might display for you is a stratification on age alone. But what we've seen up above here is that the age modification depends on gender. So these two numbers are meaningless. This number refers to the odds ratio for the young ignoring gender. But we've seen up above here that 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 that, in fact, is an oversimplification. We also get even more trouble in that the crude and combined here appear to be about the same. And so, in, in some worlds, you might say, whoa, okay, there's no evidence of confounding. But that is irrelevant. The, even a discussion of confounding is irrelevant here. And that is because of the presence of modification. And in this illustration, quite complicated modification. So we can cross, put a big red X across this one. This one is misleading us. Sure, Stata will display them and won't even make any comments or indicate that there's any problems. You need to do that. You need to think about it. You need to do that. Let's look at what appears to be 
another possible interpretation here. What happens if we stratified on gender alone? Oh my. Then the two odds ratios are nearly the same. Indeed, the test of homogeneity is not significant. That appears to suggest that gender does not modify. But again, referring to the stratification on both gender and age, we can see that gender modifies for the young and gender modifies for the old. For example, if we think about the comparison between males and females for the young, we're comparing an odds ratio of 5.97 and an odds ratio of 6. Very different. Similarly, for the old, we see we're comparing an odds ratio estimate of 3.45 with an odds ratio of 0 0.11. Very different. So notice here that this display appears to suggest that gender does not modify. But that's incorrect as well. This, again, Stata will display this sort of a table with no comment, but it's meaningless because of the correct analyses we did earlier. Finally, let's briefly look at Stata's display of the crude. You can get it from the CS command or from the CC. Let's look at CC. It's maybe we'll, we'll, we'll key on this. What do we get? The crude odds ratio is 1.5. What does that suggest? Barely an association between disease and exposure. Huh. Suggesting that exposure is a risk. But again, notice the oversimplification in this display, in this analysis that's reported here. The correct analysis is this one. Because we see that, in fact, whether or not the exposure is a risk or is protective depends on the group. And that is given to us by this important test of significance and the varying values of the estimates and the quite different confidence limits that are provided. So there you have a tour through the first of the eight example data sets for your consideration. So I guess what I'm going to tell you now is that there are seven more folks and I would strongly encourage you before proceeding with the next session to spend time with all eight of these examples. Now I've gone through the first one for you and I hope it's been done so in a fairly clear way. Again to get the second example data set you will start with this command in Stata, but instead of putting in CT1, you'll put in CT2, and that will give you the second example. Well, while we're on the topic of odds ratios, one of the questions that comes up all the time at the early stage in development of a proposal, of a project, is how many participants do I need? The whole challenge of sample size determination. This is a very large topic, and but it's one that perhaps fits in well here. Many of you will have seen in your previous uh, experience with epidemiology and biostatistics, uh, sample size 
determination methods based on power. And uh, in 2022, as we are now, is this particular uh, set of sample uh, sessions is being prepared. Many investigators are are more interested in determining sample size based on confidence limits, based on confidence intervals. Now, it is unfortunately, to my knowledge at least, not available in STATA or R right now, at least not directly. But there is a nice website that does this for you. And so I thought I would take a few minutes and discuss sample size determination based on confidence intervals for the odds ratio. This is uh, uh, maybe not quite as elementary as one might like, but I, I, I'm facing this head on and uh, would like to provide you with some illustrations now. And then we'll look at the website. So let's suppose then we'd like to address the issue of a study in which we wish to construct a single two by two table and we'd like a confidence interval for the odds ratio. Well, for this description that I'm going to give you here, we'll suppose we have a cohort study so that disease status is the outcome and exposure is the explanatory variable. And we'll further suppose that exposure increases the probability of disease. So then the odds ratio is presumed to be greater than one. We're anticipating an odds ratio that's going to be greater than one. Now, one of the first issues we face with confidence intervals for the odds ratio is that it is not symmetrical about the estimated odds ratio. Perhaps in your earlier uh, courses, you've seen confidence intervals for the mean, in which case um, most of the, the straightforward expressions are indeed uh, based on the sample average plus or minus some limit, plus, plus or minus some amount. So if in fact the odds ratio is thought to be greater than one, then the value that's of interest most often to the investigator is the lower limit of the confidence interval. We'd like then to be able to make a statement like the, with something like the confidence interval, say 95% confidence interval, will have a lower limit of some number so that we can be up so that we would then be able to say with some confidence that the odds ratio is at least whatever that number is inevitably then we're faced with discussion of the distance between this lower limit and the estimated confidence interval uh, the estimated odds ratio okay that lower width the distance between the lower limit and the estimated odds ratio. The sample size formulas that are used in this instance are based on the lower, the lower width relative to the odds ratio, which is called the relative lower width. Now, in some literature, it's also called the relative precision. So we need to be careful here. And I'll comment on this more as we proceed. And if all of this is based on a study that is more case control like or retrospective, then one needs to interchange the disease and exposure in the expressions we're going to see. So then the exposure is the outcome and the disease status is the explanatory variable. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. But we're going to work with a cohort-like study with disease status as the outcome and exposure as the explanatory variable. Hope I haven't made this too confusing. Okay, 
So, well, this is what the formula looks like. Well, what is that? Okay. That is the sample size in the unexposed group needs to be greater than this amount. So you can see we've got a percentage point from the normal distribution, the square of the logarithm of 1 minus the relative lower width, and then an expression that involves the probability of disease among the unexposed, that's p sub 0, the probability of disease among the exposed, that's p sub 1, and then k, which is the ratio of the number exposed to the number unexposed. Okay, <laughs> bit complicated. The derivation is included for the more mathematically inclined, and the derivation is included in, in the session folder. So here are, here are the, the expressions that, that I have just mentioned. <coughs> <coughs> the relative lower width. R. That's the distance between, or the difference between, the odds ratio and the lower limit, multiplied by the odds ratio, the relative lower width. K, then, is the proportion of exposed to unexposed. 1 minus alpha, now this is probably the most familiar part of this, the 95% confidence interval, we need a percentage point of 1.96. P0 is the probability of disease among the unexposed, and then the odds ratio that we anticipate. That it's used to compute P sub 1. Okay. Well, how do we go about selecting this relative lower width? Well, in, in most investigations, we would, we're anticipating that if there's any merit to such a study, we'd like the lower limit to be greater than 1. Right? The lower limit being greater than 1 is, is about making a statement that uh, with 95% confidence in it, with 95% confidence, the odds ratio will be at least, and then we, we have then some number, that lower limit, and that lower limit is greater than 1. Well, it turns out then that we need to select an R that, or a relative lower width that's, at, that's less than the odds ratio minus 1 to the odds ratio. A bit technical again, but when you try, try this out with some examples, it becomes pretty clear. Okay, so we can see that the formula that we have in this uh, in this uh, development contains the ratio of the square of that z to the square of 1 minus r. And the second term is the sum of two rather intimidating looking expressions. Well... What is, what's going on here? The smaller the relative lower width, or relative precision, the larger we get to a contribution to the sample size in those unexposed. That makes perfect sense. If we're looking for a relative lower width that's smaller, that says the confidence interval is going to be narrower, which means we're going to need more folks. Makes perfect sense. The relative precision decreases, we need more. Further, the second term has a variety of different expressions, but isn't as crucial in the establishment of the actual sample size that's needed. But it's involved, and here are some
some visuals that are in play with the establishment of the second term that's needed for this sample size. Further, we can see that once we've determined uh, the probability of disease among the unexposed, we can determine the probability of disease among the exposed from the odds ratio. And here's some visuals that can be helpful in determining that. Okay, so the point here that I want to establish for you is that if we're, if we're really anticipating that the confidence interval width and the confidence intervals is going to be the basis for our choice of sample size, we need to choose a sample size that enables those confidence interval widths, that enables the, the determination based on the relative lower width. Okay. If we have, a, in anticipating in our study, that we're going to have a single potential dichotomous potential, a confounder modifier, then that means we're going to have two two-by-two two tables. And so that then tells us that if, in fact, we'd like to be able to understand the confounding and modification issues, it suggests that the sample size determination needs to be considered for both tables. There's no other way around this. Now, if it ends up that we end up with a crude table, good enough. The overall sample size will be adequate. If we've built into it that the sample size was configured to enable us to work with two tables. Similarly, if one is able to use an adjusted after you've used the methods for each of the tables. Fair enough. Well, what if there are two potential modifier confounders? As we've seen earlier in this session, that involves very crucially to being able to see the issues that we're going to need for two by two tables, right? That is the simultaneous stratification on age and gender, for example, in the illustration we've done. That means that sample size determination needs to be established for all four of those tables. Okay. If we end up with one at a time analyses, then those sample sizes will be adequate for the uh, establishment of the one at a time analyses. Same thing with the crude. So if we build our sample size around the numbers we need in each of the four two by two tables, then when we come to the analysis based on all nine, we'll be in a good place. We may not need quite as many. At, at the, we may find out that we didn't need as many if our report is say ending and ends up with just a crude display. But we can't know that we can get to that crude display until after we've done the analysis based on all four, right? Well, yeah, and so unfortunately, it gets bigger. If there's more than two, well, then that means there's a lot of tables. And no easy way out of this, is there? So if we have, in fact, the consideration of three dichotomous potential confounder modifiers. Well, then we've got eight two by two tables. Okay. Many, many scenarios here. Many, many issues in play. Just to show you one place where you can get a sample size calculator for the odds ratio, where the goal is a confidence interval for the odds ratio. Here is one 
website where it's, it's set up fairly nicely. The language that's used by the developers of this website is a bit different from the way in which I've established it here. So I want to just take a minute to go this, through this for you. So what is often referred to as the relative lower width is also called the relative precision. And that's the language that's used here. Further, they speak of, of uh, an example from, in, from car insurance. Well, let's set this up in a more health context. And here's what it looks like. So you're first of all asked for a relative precision. That's the relative lower width. And it's, you're asked to give a percentage. The next is the confidence interval that you'd like. This is pretty standard. 90, 95%, 99%, pretty typical. The next quantity that's displayed is what they're calling the expected prevalence of the outcome in your absence group. Well, what is that? That is the probability or anticipated probability of disease in those who are not exposed. Okay, so what they're calling there the expected prevalence in the absence group is our probability of disease in those who are unexposed. Then they refer to the expected odds ratio. That is, again, the anticipated odds ratio that you have to specify. And lastly, we have <coughs> the specification of the ratio of the number exposed to the number unexposed, n1 to n0. Then the software will give you the sample size, minimum sample size, for uh, individuals in the group who are unexposed. And you can see in this in this illustration here, they give you the number 144. Notice how big the odds ratio is here. Yeah, I know. Okay. Relative precision, though, wanting a 50% is fairly substantial. Then they give you some other scenarios that you might like to face. And this is the kind of thing one sees in investigations like this so that you can then begin to explore well if i vary some of these these uh characteristics that i don't know yet and if i vary them in a in a sensible way what sorts of numbers will i need for those in uh, the group that are unexposed and then i can compute k times that number to give me the sample size for those in the exposed group. I would I would anticipate sometimes that the K would be one, that you would have a, a circumstance where you are hoping for roughly equal numbers of exposed and unexposed, but those of you who've been involved in health research know that sometimes it can be relatively easy to get an unexposed participants, but the exposed participants are harder to get, and so on. The last part to this particular session, session number two, that I'd like to discuss briefly is the use of R to carry out stratified analyses. As I mentioned, this is 2022, and the use of, of R is growing very, very steadily. Uh, Stata has been used for these sessions for many years. The future remains uncertain as to whether or not uh, students and users of models in epidemiology and biostatistics We'll want to see analyses with R. And 
maybe even other uh, systems. There's some consideration these days that perhaps our courses ought to be using Python or ought to be using Julia. These are questions I don't propose to address here. However, what was essentially a piece to R that I could not find in an adequate form when uh, I was building together these sessions a few years back was how to carry out a detailed stratif stratified analysis with R. It turned out that there was a, uh, a package in R called Epi Display that had part of what was needed. And so I have uh, very, very liberally modified that particular function from the Epi Display package, and it is included with the uh, Session 2 materials in the Session 2 folder. So I won't go on too long with this except to briefly illustrate that if you have set up the uh, the R uh, function strat, and we, I'm not going to detail how that is done, that might be done in, in, in a later session, but I, I am supposing here that that people who are reading this particular uh, place in session number two have some familiarity with R and would know how to place an R function in R. I use R with R Studio almost exclusively, and it's a relatively easy process to do so. So in any case, this is what the analysis would look like. Let's look at the call flesh example very briefly here then. If we have the strat function and then we specify uh, the success variable, the uh, pretreatment variable TR and the surgery strata variable. So this is an example with outcome, explanatory, uh, and then stratification variable. If you do so, this is what you see. Then the strat function uh, outputs the two two by two tables that we saw in the call flesh analyses, the dis display with the risk estimates and the odds estimates are, are shown in this fairly compact way, which we've seen before. Then STRAT gives a stratified analysis for the odds ratio, which is very close to what one sees uh, from Stata. There's a minor issue here that I that I, I will uh, comment on, and that is exact p-values and exact methods have been used with the OR utility. And uh, so there are some minor differences. Perhaps enough said here. You can compare and see what the, the, the differences are. So we get the estimates of the odds ratio stratified on surgery type, the crude and the adjusted. Then we get uh, the analysis for a uh, risk ratio. This is as was included in the uh, session one materials. And the same thing for the uh, uh, risk difference. Now, you'll see here that I am including what are called adjusted for the risk ratio and adjusted for the uh, risk difference. 
uh, as detailed in those materials so as to agree with with Stata. I'd also like to point out that whether or not this method of adjustment for the risk ratio or the risk difference will be the, the standard moving forward is still an issue that is uh, being discussed and is perhaps still, shall we say, uh, a research issue.